It was a warm July morning, with the sea serene and beautiful, as the periscope of the American submarine L-2 broke surface, and Lieutenant Danvers swept to the horizon. The place, the western approaches to the English Channel. The time, 8 o'clock of July 10th, 1918. A dangerous place, and a dangerous time. We present the story of the haunted U-boat, one of the great mysteries of the sea. The First World War had reached its final stages, but the undersea struggle went on with undiminished savagery. Lieutenant Danvers carried out a systematic sweep across the horizon and then swung the periscope back and began again. Yes, there, there was something, the slimmest line of black. He studied it carefully. A ship without smoke, a very slender ship, whose superstructure must be negligible. It was always a thrilling moment when the magical lens picked up something across the waste of water which might be the next prey, the next challenger, or even, at a remote chance, a friend. But submarines had few friends, and speed of action was imperative. He passed the message to the captain who came to the periscope at once. A quick glance at the silhouette, and he pressed the bell for action stations. engines at half speed, they moved cautiously forward. Everyone stood ready at instruments and torpedoes, and everyone fell silent in the submarine. In the old days, submarines were fairly safe from retaliation, but now, countermeasures have become much more effective, and even the easiest prey turned out to be armed to the teeth. Still the captain puzzled over the steadily growing shape. What manner of ship was this, which did not seem to have any leeway, which lay so very low in the water and appeared to be could it be drifting? Suddenly, the captain said, Well, I'll be damned. That's a submarine, Danvers. And what's more, it's a German submarine. It seemed impossible. There on the surface, fully exposed and hove to, an enemy submarine just asking for trouble. She would never be there to recharge her batteries in daylight. That was done at night. Nor would she be caught napping like this unless... unless something was wrong. She'd suffered some damage, or... Torpedoes at the ready. It could be a trick, of course. A superbly executed trick. Once he showed his nose above the water, the shells would come crashing across. And then, as he closed in on the submarine, he suddenly saw a startling sight. There seemed to grow out of the submarine's bows the figure of an extraordinary man. Like a man of destiny who stood there, staring straight ahead, with his arms folded across his chest, ignoring the sea washing over his feet. It was an effigy of a man, a figure carved in... in what? The captain swore softly to himself. What in God's name did all this mean? Now they were almost at the perfect point to make certain that their torpedoes would hit the submarine. His hand moved to the firing button. As he hesitated, he automatically registered the number of the U-boat. U-65. And then... <laughs> Bewildered momentarily, the captain wondered whether Torpedo Control had anticipated his message and fired off the tin fish. Then he realised that the explosion had come from inside the U-boat or from some other attacking force. As the sea subsided and oil spread on the surface, he suddenly remembered the man on the bows. But a quick search revealed no survivors, no bodies, nothing except odd pieces of wreckage. As he gave orders to change course and continued on his routine patrol, the captain sat in front of his logbook, wondering how to describe the extraordinary incident. 
There was something uncanny about it, something which defied rational analysis. Back at base, American intelligence officers brooded over his report and rejected the hint of, was it the supernatural? They watched the German reports of missing U-boats, and sure enough, at the end of the month, German Naval HQ issued the communique. One of our U-boats, the UB-65, is missing. It must be presumed lost with 34 officers and men. Neither British nor American submarine destroyer forces laid claim to disabling U-boat 65, and the Admiralty came to the conclusion that some terrible internal accident had eventually blown the sub to smithereens. There remained the L2 captain's story of a solitary man standing on the bows of the U-boat, staring straight at the American submarine, a ghost figure with arms folded like and Lieutenant Danvers repeated it, like a man of destiny. What was unknown to British and American intelligence had become almost a legend in German naval circles. For there was indeed something quite sinister about Ubo 65, which certainly smelt of the supernatural and converted a single strange episode into a supernatural labyrinth. Externally, she was described by her builders in straightforward terms. One of 24 new U-boats built in the shipyards of Bruges, Belgium, each of 500 tons with a cruising speed of 50 knots and equipped with multiple torpedo tubes. She first came into service at a time when it looked as if the Germans might succeed in their policy of starving Britain into surrender. A death chain of U-boats surrounded Britain, crippling and sinking merchant ships at a faster rate than they were being built. Even before she was launched, she aroused the suspicion of German naval ratings. The haunting of U-boat 65 all began when a heavy girder slipped and crushed two men to death. Eight weeks later, a series of faults developed in the engine room and quickly generated deadly fumes. Reports vary as to the number who died this time, but at least three men were suffocated. A splendid mass launching ceremony of the 24 submarines was attended by none other than Admiral Schroeder himself. Early one morning in the late autumn of 1916, with the flags flying, the bands playing, and a group of high-ranking officers, led by Admiral Schroeder, watching the ceremony, the 24 deadly black shapes slid into the sea. Schroeder made a brief patriotic speech, with passionate reference to the fatherland, and the scene was set for a tremendous new attack on enemy shipping. On board the U-65, the crew were not at their ease. As one naval rating later said, We had heard too many stories Naval security men had done their best to laugh them off or suppress them, but you can't easily convince a sailor once the suspicions are aroused. I was not an experienced sailor, I was, I was one of the young ones. But the atmosphere caught at me. I couldn't escape a sense of anxiety, a very special kind of anxiety. U-65 behaved very well as she made her way out to deep water on her maiden voyage but the first deep dive would be the crucial test. Fully aware of the supercharged atmosphere in the submarine, the commander decided to allay these fears by having an experienced first lieutenant engineer systematically examine the hull before the dive. And now something happened which did anything but reassure the crew. Various versions are available of the engineer's fate. One said he climbed out onto the slippery hull, lost his footing, slipped overboard, and a thorough search was made for him without result. Another that he deliberately stepped into the sea, convinced that a clean death in the ocean was better than suffocating many fathoms down, trapped in a steel box. As one commentator said, doesn't really matter which version one accepts, the effect on the crew either way was bad. Here, immediately on sailing, the hidden evil possessing the U-boat had struck again. The commander now knew he must carry out his first dive swiftly if he was to dispel the terrible atmosphere which had arisen in the sub. A second engineer made a quick check of valves, compartments and hull, and then came the order, Diving stations! The depth gauge, a carefully calibrated, sensitive instrument of the most modern kind, registered every downward move. 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 35, and there it should have stopped. That was the depth ordered. But to his horror, the commander saw the dial move on, registering 40 feet, 45, 
50. He rang the dive controller. Yes, they were slipping far beyond the expected depth. No, nothing seemed to stop her. Very few of the crew knew what had happened, just a handful of key men. But their tension conveyed itself. And when a muffled bump at last shook the hull of the submarine, everyone guessed the answer. They were on the seabed. In every part of the U-boat, men looked at one another with fear in every face. The voodoo was working on the first day, the first exercise, the first dive. It seemed incredible. Many of the crew had expected trouble, but not at once, not on the very first day. All signs of panic were carefully controlled. These men were trained to face up to emergencies. And the commander had already spoken to the crew, assuring them that all the surfacing equipment was undamaged. What he did not tell all of them was that he'd already made one attempt to surface without success. Now he repeated the surfacing drill time and time again. Still the Black Hulk stayed inert. Two hours went by and the crew grew restless. The commander kept everyone busy. Three hours, four, five. Suddenly came the report of a leak. The hull must have suffered some slight damage as it settled on the seabed and water was slowly seeping into one compartment. In a final emergency, the watertight bulkhead would deal with the leak but now every nerve, every effort went to willing the surfacing apparatus into successful action. A change became apparent in the air. A strange smell permeated compartment after compartment. All the old hands knew what it meant. The sea had seeped into one of the batteries and these heady fumes were only the beginning of what would soon be generated. Nine hours, 10, 12. By the 12th hour, many of the crew were coughing from the fumes. Discipline threatened to collapse, and the U-boat commander drew his revolver. And then the miracle happened. She trembled, moved, and staggered off the seabed like a wounded leviathan. For a few seconds, she seemed to hover above the seabed, and even the coughing, choking seamen were silent and listened tensely, straining on a knife edge of terror and hope in case she crashed back again. But she lurched higher. They were going up, painfully, slowly, as if dragging a weight far beyond her powers. And then the conning tower broke surface, the hatch snapped open, the men staggered out, gulping down clean, fresh, miraculous sea air. What a moment. No one who survived the war ever forgot it. There was no alternative but to run the risk of staying on the surface all the way back to Bruges. However, they reached their base safely, and at once an investigation began. No details of the report were ever released in print, but the crew found all official investigations superfluous. The explanation was simple, the voodoo. It was there in the ship, part of her nature. Whoever sailed in her would meet trouble. Admiral Schroeder now decided to give the crew a complete rest from the haunted ship while she was overhauled and refitted. A skeleton crew remained behind for security reasons, but within a few days another remarkable incident occurred. Sitting reading in the wardroom, the first lieutenant suddenly heard a rush of feet and into the cabin burst a petty officer with a look of absolute horror on his face. He gasped out, The dead man! The dead man is his come aboard! For God's sake, calm yourself. Have you been drinking? He came aboard. He's back again. I saw him, the one killed by the torpedo. This, this ship is haunted. Wait here. I'll be back. The first lieutenant raced up on deck to find an able seaman leaning against the conning tower in a distraught state. It is true. I, I saw him too. Well, where is he now? I can't see anything. He's gone, but he was there. I swear he was there. The first lieutenant went below again and cross-examined the petty officer. Tell me exactly what you saw. It was unmistakably him. The same face, the same walk. He came aboard and strolled towards the bows, then suddenly turned around and crossed his arms over his chest. He simply stared at, through me. It was horrible. The first lieutenant ordered both men to stay in the wardroom until the commander could be traced and brought aboard. When he arrived, they repeated their story exactly as before. The commander warned them that they risked severe penalties if they repeated one word of their story to anyone else. He then pointed out very carefully that there were two possible and quite rational explanations. 
It could, of course, be that some of your shipmates have played a practical joke on you. That is more than likely. But there is another possibility. There are Belgians in this dockyard who work secretly for the enemy. They would wish to try to undermine the morale of our submarine's crews. This might be one very effective way of doing it, if you take any notice of all this nonsense. One of their numbers played at being the ghost. So try to forget all about it, and remember, not a word to any member of the crew. One of the two men concerned was Seaman Pedersen. In the early morning of the day before the UB-65 was due to sail once more, the first lieutenant found a letter pinned to Pedersen's bunk, addressed to the commander. The letter said he believed that the fate of all those foolish enough to sail in UB-65 was sealed. No one could possibly return, and for all his devotion to the fatherland, to the commander and to the service, he had no alternative but to desert. Seaman Pedersen was never heard of again. Meanwhile, the following day, the U-boat kept to her schedule and moved stealthily out into the channel. There's no record of what her commander felt, but he must have had a more than difficult task. The steadily built up voodoo surrounding his ship could not be dispelled by logical explanation. The irrational appealed to seamen much more than the rational. It seemed highly likely that all the commander's threats had not stopped the story of the dead man coming aboard again, reaching the crew. As the sub entered the Straits of Dover, it must have been a time of great anxiety. These narrow straits were heavily patrolled by British warships, looking for just such a prey as this. But UB-65 came through safely and made swiftly for the western approaches to the channel. On the second day out, the commander slackened speed and began to comb the area for unprotected merchantmen. About eight o'clock in the evening, an observer reported a merchantman moving steadily towards her home port. Action stations were sounded, and the commander manoeuvred steadily closer to the ship. This was a testing time for the sub, the crew, and the voodoo. If they came through the action safely, they might have outfaced the voodoo, the ghost, and the whole long trail of accident and disaster which had dogged the ship. Everything went off splendidly. The U-boat fixed the merchantman in the torpedo lens, the commander pressed the firing button, the torpedoes sped on their way, and the unfortunate ship split asunder, burst into flames, and sank. Diving stations. As the command rang through the submarine, everyone sprang to the alert. This was the crucial moment, the crucial test, the danger spot where the voodoo could strike again. But they sank deeper and deeper into the ocean. And, safe at last, the commander and crew congratulated themselves on having simultaneously broken the spell and scored a victory. The night passed uneventfully, and just before the dawn, UB-65 surfaced to recharge her batteries. This action was fraught with fresh danger. Every possible angle of approach to the submarine was carefully scanned by lookouts. Half an hour went by without incident. One hour, one and a half hours. And then suddenly, a cry from the port bow. Look, hey Commandant, look! Hey man! The commander in the conning tower turned to the spot indicated. First he looked at the horizon, and then he realized that the lookout was pointed to the submarine's own bow. And there he saw another man, whom he took at first glance to be a member of the crew. But the man stood on a dangerous part of the deck, washed by seas, and miraculously kept his balance, with his arms folded across his chest. The commander called to him, and the figure slowly turned, and as he turned, there was something horribly familiar about him, something very like the officer who died all those months before. In later weeks, one of the officers concerned admitted that it could have been a trick of light and shade, darkness and dawn, and certainly the apparition faded as quickly as he'd come, but there was no convincing the crew. Not only did the commander mark his report on this highly confidential, but he intended to deliver it personally to the Admiral upon their return. But on that very day, the Allies launched an air raid on the base of Bruges, caught the commander unprotected on the streets, and smote him down with a steel bomb splinter, as certainly as a man is stabbed in a dark street by an unseen assassin. Now clearly the Allied aircraft were not in the pay or service of supernatural forces and the commander's death could be explained away as a tragic coincidence. 
but no such rationalizations had any effect on the crew. When they heard the news, their reaction varied from anxiety and foreboding to, in some cases, near terror. The report, taken from the body of the commander, was duly delivered to Admiral Schroeder, and he decided to pay a personal visit to the submarine. A hard-headed skeptic, quite incapable of believing in ghosts, Admiral Schroeder sat in the commander's cabin, separately interviewing each member of the crew. He grew more and more astonished as the evidence accumulated, first at the gullibility of sailors, and then at the consistency of the story each one repeated. There seemed to be only one thing for it. If these men believed all this nonsense, then he'd better invoke their spiritual mentors to exorcise the devil which had taken possession of the ship. And thus it came about that a highly placed member of the church, with full religious regalia, led a mixed procession of the clergy and the services in a ceremony intended to drive out the ghostly presence with Latin ritual and heavenly fire. Immediately afterwards, the whole crew was sent on leave, and two weeks later returned to a refurnished, spiritually cleansed U-boat. A new commander, Commander Scheller, specially chosen for his disbelief in ghosts, now made it quite clear that a ghost-free regime had begun. Things went well for UB-65 for the next 12 months. No new disaster overtook her. But early in the summer of 1918, the presence began to make itself felt with renewed force. And according to one account, a certain petty officer, Richard Meyer, committed suicide. It is difficult in the long story, not only to disentangle the natural from the supernatural, but also fact from fiction and some newspaper stories on the subject read like the inventions of ingenious reporters hard up for real news. Certainly there was one dramatic sortie into the Western approaches. It seemed like a routine attack on a convoy with a small naval escort until they moved in for the kill. Suddenly the sound of engines overhead became very loud and a moment later explosions began to shake the UB-65 from stem to stern. It was always in moments like this that the voodoo came back to men's minds. And now, as the light suddenly went out, natural fear was intensified by the thought of the ghost presence moving somewhere in the darkness. Then the U-boat began to sink slowly, and fear became panic in at least one man's mind. He knew, no one else did, that no amount of tank blowing or mechanical manipulation could stop this steady descent to a depth which would crush the hull like an eggshell if it was the result of supernatural forces. Then, suddenly, the U-boat's descent stopped, and she hung there, many fathoms deep, her engines dead still. The explosions died away, and the sound of engines diminished. Commander Scheller decided to stay where he was, with a very frightened crew, waiting until the enemy had really disappeared. It was a terrible hour. He dare not try out the engines or controls to see what damage the depth charges had done for fear of being detected again by the destroyers. But his crew seemed on the point of mutiny in their desperate desire to know whether their means of reaching sweet fresh air was still effective. Another hour went by, and now he gave the order, prepare to surface. A cry of jubilation broke from one man's lips as he heard the engines throb to life and felt the ship lift slowly, yes, even lumberingly, upwards. Almost simultaneously, the lights came on again. They were saved. But back at base, Commander Scheller reported the effect of the ghost on his crew's morale, and this determined Admiral Schroeder to deal with this menace once and for all. He not only replaced the commander, the whole crew was completely changed. And when U-boat 65 sailed again, she was manned by young men fresh from training school who had had no chance to pick up hints of the ghost legend. She left her base in July 1918 and never returned. The mystery remains a complete mystery today. Many investigations have been made, many theories put forward. Among them, that the crew mutinied when the ghost appeared again during a depth charge attack that they took control of the sub, placed explosives ready to blow her up, left the captain aboard at pistol point, then pushed off in their rubber dinghies 
hoping to be picked up by the Allies. Hence the solitary figure waiting for death and the explosion. It could conceivably work, but for one snag, the crew never were picked up. No survivors of U-65 were ever found. Of course, they could easily have run into rough weather and drowned. But whatever happened, they took the true explanation of the mystery of UB-65 down to the depths with them. The story of the haunted U-boat was written by Vincent Brougham and told by Geoffrey Banks.